Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to make sure you were there. Uh, so today, uh, I'm really uh, honored and excited to uh, be introducing our first keynote. Um, and this is um, a very, a very special person for people in our business. Um, back in, well, let's not get into details, but a while back, uh, in, in the course of a week, this person um, designed uh, the bulk of both the hardware and the operating system for the famed BBC microcomputer, uh, to which a generation, I would say, in the UK owe their beginnings. Uh, I certainly know of one person here with us who, who was started on the BBC Micro. Uh, and then after that, uh, she went on to create the um, ARM chipset, uh, basically, and that is what, of course, is powering 95% of the devices that geeks like us carry around. So this is, is someone whose contributions are really hard to quantify in our business, um, but she is here to share uh, some of her insights on um, the future of microprocessors, uh, and she's got a lot of stuff to tell us. So I am not going to go through the long list of honors and the many achievements. Instead, we're going to directly welcome Sophie Wilson to the EuroPython stage. Please, a big welcome. Thank you, Naomi. Um, so we'll be cantering through um, if you really, really, really have to ask a question, then wave at me. But otherwise, questions in the break. Um, so we'll be talking about microprocessors. So about 40 years since it was introduced. And in that time, 10,000 times faster, billions of times more common. And the world now relies on them, especially in a pandemic. We'll look at how we got here and what the future might be. There'll be a couple of laws and quite a few graphs. But first, what is a microprocessor? A microprocessor is composed of digital logic carrying out multiple steps to execute each instruction. So we've got to fetch an instruction from memory, decode the instruction to find out what on earth to do, read the values required for the instruction. So for example, fetch some values from registers inside the processor. And then we've got to carry out the desired computation. So if it was an add instruction, we've got to add two values together. And then we've got to write the result back into the register file of the processor. So everything's broken into the steps like that or smaller. And each piece of digital logic in those steps is made out of many, many transistors. So better transistors or more transistors means better microprocessors, which takes us to the first law. So Gordon Moore at Intel made a, an observation that you know, if he kept watching every six months, somebody would make transistors better on smaller silicon. And he said that the number of transistors he could fit on a piece of silicon doubled every, well, it was adjusted later, every two years. And for a long time, this has been a prophecy that has always been fulfilled. So the observation was taken as the driving force for the development of new silicon manufacturing, first by the ITRS and now um, by the IRDS. And you know, their mission is to harness the world's semiconductor engineers to make Gordon Moore's law as true as possible. So you often see abstract pictures showing things with lots more processes on them as you go through time. Um, but what does it actually mean? So in this picture on the wall behind me is a plot of ARM1, which was designed in a three micron process and then to the same physical scale is a plot of ARM Cortex-M0 plus in a modern 20 nanometer process. And it's that tiny black dot. So that's a scale change of 70,000 times in area. 
That's what's happened. We can put the same complexity, so we could either have 70,000 of the same thing, or we could spend 70,000 times as many transistors um, in the same area as an ARM1. So how many transistors do you need for a working microprocessor? This is the circuit diagram of a 6502 um, on the right, topologically distorted to match the final chip layout on the left. So colors in this are, you know, if, you, if you've ever seen a silicon chip, it's just this dull slug of, of colorless nothing. But if we shine very bright lights on the chip, we can get different effects. So this is, green color is produced by diffraction. So this is the main instruction decoder of the 6502, and it's a grid of metal. So we get diffraction of the light to produce green. Here, there's no metal sitting on top of the silicon. The light went into the silicon, came back out again, came out as yellow. And then we get different forms of diffraction for the reds. Um, there's a whole subculture of shining bright lights on chips to take pretty pictures. Um, so you, you can see this is quite messy. The 6502 was designed and laid out entirely by hand. Somebody sat um, next to giant um, drawing boards sticking bits of rubylith tape onto transparencies to make the masks for this. In fact, several electronic engineers and a bunch of high school graduates sat in bungalows in Phoenix, Arizona sticking rubylith tape to make that from the circuit diagram. Um, so, you know, 4,000 transistors, you can do it by hand, it's painful, but you can do it. Um, what do you get? You get something that ran at about a megahertz, those transistors were fastish. You get 8-bit operations, you simply, you know, 4,000 transistors, it's not enough to have really complicated operations. Um, it was enough for very limited form of pipelining, so they took two clocks to read in a, an 8-bit instruction and an 8-bit immediate, and it took two cycles to execute it, which is quite good for the time. It was a giant 21 square millimeters in size, and we'd characterize it nowadays as six micron smallest feature size. Um, so smallest feature size does not mean a transistor is six microns across. They were hundreds of microns across. I mean, you could see them. You know, transistors are big um, for this. Um, the block diagram of a 6502 is on the right. Single lines are single digital communications. Fat lines are, in this case, 8-bit buses. So mostly 8-bit buses are going around. If you're executing an instruction, you're reading something into the ALU, um, possibly from the accumulator or over the buses, and then writing a result, moving things back. We don't have very many registers, and those that we do are only 8 bits. So we've got an 8-bit accumulator, 8-bit index registers, and a, a precious 16-bit, no, 8-bit stat pointer. Even, that, even the stat pointer is 8 bits. So Gordon Moore's handle is wound. We get some more transistors. Um, we get to have much more fun as we get more transistors. So this is ARM1. On the left is Steve Ferber's original pencil sketch of how ARM1 would be laid out. So you have to choose where things go. On the right is something that really looks very different from the shot of the 6502. This is ARM1. This was designed by computers driven by humans. So um, we'll see the next chip will be designed in a different way by computers. But this was a tickle script to take a register cell that had been designed by hand and replicate it all over the register file. So there's 32 bits of register down and 20-odd registers across. And the little bit there is the program counter. So 
a big thing has changed in that you can make out really coherent features. On the 6502 shot, that big green area of the instruction decoder, that shrunk. This is the dis instruction decoder of an arm. So something's happened in the development of microprocessors to make that possible. Um, and obviously that thing was risk. But anyway, so what did we get with these transistors? Um, we got something that ran faster, 8 megahertz. So we'd got better transistors that ran faster, but we'd also been able to use more transistors to make it run faster. So this thing is fully pipelined. Each cycle, it can fetch an instruction and carry it out continuously. So it can do a fetch, decode and read registers, execute and write registers, a three-cycle pipeline with this number of transistors. It's a little bit larger than a 6502 and was designed in a process that's twice as good, but that twice as good in both directions. That's four times as many transistors per unit area. And we get a very similar picture of a microprocessor, but now the buses are all 32 bits. We've got a much bigger register file and a bigger ALU. But you know, fundamentally, it's pretty much the same. So Gordon Moore's handle is wound again. And now we get uh, a smaller process. What we, can we do with 6 million transistors to build a processor? And I'm talking just about the transistors in the processor. This is excluding any caches or anything like that. So the first thing is the picture's got a bit fuzzy. Transistors have got really, really small. You can still see some features. These yellow areas are the register file of Firepath. There's a thing down the middle, and the processor looks pretty symmetrical with the top and bottom part. But transistors are so small that you get mush where the computation elements are, where you could see clearly on the 6502. So we're getting better, faster transistors, and we can burn a lot of them to go fast. So suddenly now we're running at 330 megahertz. We've got 6 million transistors, so we can have complicated instructions. This machine executes four 64-bit operations per cycle. Or in this particular case, um, you can do 32 8-bit operations per cycle. Or this is, uh, what is that? That's eight 32-bit operations per cycle. And it can do that per cycle, in, and it can fully sustain doing that compound instruction. So this says, add this register pair to this register pair and put the result there, while loading a two lots of register pairs in here and keeping going. So everything in this machine is executing PAC SIMD. It's designed to do multiplier accumulates. We burnt a lot of transistors doing multiplier accumulates. It's tiny, seven square millimeters, and a 130 nanometer process um, means lots of transistors fitted into a small area. It's actually pretty complicated to design instructions much more complicated than this. Um, it, it seems to be some natural limit of how much you can get the compiler team to deal with. Um, so as you use more, you know, Gordon Moore's handle is going to give us more transistors. So what do we do with them? Well, we put down multiple processors. So instead of getting co computers with much more complicated instruction sets, what we get is multiple microprocessors. So here's the fire path that we started with. And here's its reflection the other way around. And then we're burning lots of space with c giant caches and on-chip memory. And we've got a little logic I.O. buffers. And th that thing is um, 16 channels of DSL to your home. And we can keep doing this. Um, I've made a career out of doing this. Um, so if we've got smaller transistors, that means my more microprocessors. So this is more fire paths. There's a fire path. There's a fire path. There's a fire path. There's a fire path. Blocks of memory all over blocks memory down the middle, I.O. systems are shrinking compared with the fire paths. 
Um, so this thing is, what's that? That's 12 channels of VDSL2 to your home. So I can keep doing this all day. The current chips in those green cabinets bringing DSL to your home um, have 12 fire paths, but I'm working in a data parallel world where my systems can be replicated. Um, if you don't have that property and can do computation in pure parallel, then you run into a real law with a real equation and a real graph. Gene Amdahl observed that, oops, there, the speed up of multiple processes is limited by the sequential part of the program. So he's got an equation. Hooray, it's a real law. You can't break this law. So if you've got a single program to execute and it's got a sequential part and a parallel part and 95% of your program is parallel, then you're in the green curve. And the parallel portion means that even if I supply an infinite number of microprocessors, um, the speed up is limited to 20x of executing it on one microprocessor. So that's pretty serious. 95% parallel is pretty much a ray tracing sort of program where there's a lot of parallelism. Most of the programs you work with are not that parallel. So if I merely have 90% parallel, I get 10x speed up. If I have 75% parallel, which is about where web browsers are, then even with an infinite number of pro processors, I only get 4x speed up, which is pretty sad. And a compiler, they're usually about 50% parallel. Oh dear, they only get a 2x speed up of my 65,000. 536 processors. That's a shame because the industry can and will continue, continue to make you hardware that has ever increasing amounts of parallel computation and not merely multiprocessors but will give you all sorts of SIMD data types, vector processing engines, matrix processing engines, all sorts of additions which you can't make use of. Traditional scalar computation will not increase very much going forwards. Indeed, it hasn't increased very much going backwards since about 2006. We've hit sort of peak performance per clock and peak clock rates. It has become much more power efficient. We can give you many more processors without burning your house down. But scalar programming languages, such as Python, are a very poor fit to the parallel hardware, and there's no automatic compilation of scalar programs that you write to parallel hardware for all problem types. We can do it if we try very hard for certain problem types, but mostly in a work. So you guys out there, we need a revolution in software. We need a better way to program multi core processors. Off you go. Um, I've been presenting this slide set for nearly 15 years. No change. <laughs> so although we keep getting more transistors, more transistors aren't actually as useful as they were. So we had a time when processors were young and we were increasing performance about 25% a year. Then we had the risk resolution and a thing called Denard scaling, a much better law than Moore's law is Denard scaling. Denard scaling says that as I make the transistors smaller, I reduce the operating voltage and con consume um, exponential amounts less power. So that was really good. Um, so we had a nice Denard scaling era of performance going up rapidly. Then we hit the end of Denard scaling, which was a bit of a problem. And then we went to out-of-order architectures to push up performance by 23% a year, which is only like that. And then we started running into Amdahl's law, where adding more processors really doesn't help. And now it's getting really, really hard, and we're doing stupid things to increase scalar processing performance. Stupid, stupid things. <laughs> There isn't time. Um, so why, why is this so exquisitely painful? 
Well, the first thing is transistors do get more power efficient, even without dented scale in. Building smaller transistors which have less capacitance means that the power for a, a given transition on a transistor is less. But we use so many more of them in a small space, things get hot. Um, th this uh, slide set is not meant to poke a lot of fun at Intel, but uh, this is derived by looking at Intel chips. So here we go. So they started with the, the 386. 486, the world's first parallel, um, sorry, the world's first superscalar out of order processor. Then they built the Pentium, the Pentium Pro, the Pentium 2, the Pentium 3. Oh, look, hot plate. Amount of energy per square centimeter of the processor means you can fry eggs on it. I mean, the Pentium Pro, Pentium 2, you can fry an egg on the processor. It'd have to be a very small egg to sit on the one square millimeter but you can fry an egg on it, it's got hot. They kept going with the same microarchitecture, Pentium 2, Pentium 3, Pentium 4. Oh, they didn't quite make it to nuclear reactor levels of power density. It got very difficult to, to cool. So Pentium 4, the infamous Nehalem, they had to essentially throw this microarchitecture away, go back to first principles, and start again to build the modern core microarchitecture and stop being so stupidly hot, which is a shame because we never got to the rocket nozzle. <laughs> <laughs> so Andel's law really hurts, but power is also constraining the future. So the power used by transistors isn't decreasing as fast as the size reductions of the transistors, even assuming multi-gate fin fets the fin is a real fin, it sticks up. Um, as we go forward, increasing amounts of the silicon that you pay your hard-end money for is going to sit being dark, unpowered, not used. So you've got this lovely smartphone, it's got a lot of computation engines in it, both visible ones in terms of multiple cores that you could theoretically write a parallel program across, but also other engines, neural engines, GPUs and so on. And to make it not burn a hole in your pocket, we turn all of that off as much as we possibly can. So stuff is unpowered. You're used to stuff being unpowered in your pocket, otherwise your batteries would run down. But now we're having to do unpowered on desktop computers as well. If you've got a desktop computer, the sort of thing that keeps your office warm, um, it's chucking out hundreds of watts of energy, as a byproduct to doing all this computation. But if we assume a 125 watt power limit for convenient silent air cooling, then for seven nanometer processors, we have to turn half of the processor off all the time, otherwise it will be too hot. And going forward, if we 3D stack uh, our transistors, then the cooling is going to be a problem. Power is really, really bad. Now, this sounds quite depressing, but it's worse. <laughs> There's no immediate physical limit to, to further scaling from today's processors. We know that there's no demon, um, there's no engineer coming in saying, the engines can tape it, Captain. The engines can take it. Um, we c we, we're building lots of chips in 28. That, that's a volume process for all the cheap chips, 20. We've got seven nanometer chips from Intel, Huawei, Qualcomm. AMD and Apple have five in production. Uh, NVIDIA, Huawei, Samsung also have some fives. And we've got four and three in development. But for the first time in history, as we make transistors smaller, they cost more. So we used to make transistors smaller. We used less silicon. Sure, the process got a bit more complicated, but overall, the cost per transistor kept going down. Now the cost per transistor is going up. You'll have noticed your shiny devices cost more. This is why. They're more complicated to design, which hurts, but they're more complicated to manufacture. The transistor cost goes up. So this is going to hurt. This is sort of the end of Moore's law. Only some things will be worth the greater expense of small process geometries. And I think you can already see that. 
um, releases of new chips in new process geometries is now confined just to the majors, the minor people. I work for Broadcom, we're the largest fabulous semiconductor manufacturer in the world, and we can't afford some of these exotic processes because our run of chips will be too small to make it pay. We can afford to do it for some things, but most of our chips, no. Now, it's time to talk about all these little asterisks that I've been putting on the slides. So when we moved from planar transistors, a planar transistor is a flat one. So we put a source and a drain next to each other, and we put a gate between them. Applying a charge to the gate affects how electrons flow between the source and the drain. That's a field effect transistor. That's the transistor that won. There were loads of other transistor designs, but everything now is made out of field effect transistors. So um, as we scaled down a planar transistor and everything got small, things started not to work very well. The, this thing called the gate contact area, where the field effect of the gate affects the slow flow of electrons, got too small to make good transistors. So round about 20 nanometers, we've got very leaky transistors that don't turn on or off properly because the gate's too small. So what we did as a semiconductor industry was to make our transistor vertical. So we took the source and the drain and we made them like that and then we wrapped the gate around them. So that's the fin in FinFET. It's a vertical fin and we've increased the gate contact area massively and made a better transistor. Now, as we did that conversion from planar to FinFET, um, that gave us more transistors per square millimeter. In the same process, we just had some ways of going up. So we didn't change our lithography, we didn't change anything. Metal tracks are still exactly the same as they were. The transistors got smaller. So the industry made up a new name. So if we took a 28 nanometer process and made FinFET on it, which was the first ever production of FinFET by Intel, they called it 22. It was a 28 nanometer process and they called it 22. If we took a 20 nanometer process with a FinFET, people called it 14 or 16, and we've had 12, 10, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, and 3 in FinFET. Intel used to have a different name to the foundry companies making chips, but uh, they decided when Pat Gelsinger became boss of Intel to join in um, with everybody else and use the same naming convention because it was getting very confusing. Um, so they all make up names the same way. Um, but they're all made up. There is nothing five nanometer about an M2 Mac silicon, it's made on a five nanometer process, they say, but nothing in there is as small as five nanometer. Whereas before, if you talk about uh, 130 nanometer, there were things in there that were identifiably 130 nanometers in size. So that, that's, that's a little diversion because I needed to explain so some time. Now, back to economic problems. It's getting really expensive to do this. To maintain Moore's law, it takes about 18, scientists, 18 times as many scientists per Moore's Law step as it did in the 1970s. It's getting quite hard. If you look at this another way, it means that each researcher's output is 18 times less effective in terms of generating economic value than it was several decades ago. Uh, that means a shrinking pool of scientists because you can't afford to pay as many. And it's going forward. You can draw graphs about this. On an annual basis, research productivity in the semiconductor industry is declining at a rate of about 6.8% per year. Um, you could say we're running out of ideas. So we're now going to look forward. So my health warning on looking forward. Predictions are very hard to make, especially out about the future. In April 2002, the head of Intel predicted that we'd have 30 gigahertz 10 billion transistor chips by 2010. You will have noticed that he was wrong. <laughs> and we've seen some of the reasons why that didn't happen. Um, there, there was a sort of cap. 
it's pretty hard to make stuff that goes at five gigahertz and stick to any power limits. Now, I, um, I don't like to beat up on Intel, but they do make very optimistic statements and then contradict them. So back in 2010, the date that at which they predicted that they'd have those very fast chips, um, they gave a presentation about their foundry skills. Intel liked to claim they have the best foundry in the world. So they said, we've got a, 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 we've got a lot of innovation coming. We've got a technology pipeline. It's full. Um, sure, we've got our first FinFET devices going forwards. Um, we'll, we'll make that about 2011. And then we know how to make 15, 11, and 8. And they'll come out in about 2013, 2015, 2017. And going forward, we've got all sorts of things that we'll do. Um, we'll make carbon nanotube FETs. Um, we'll make ultra-dense SRAM with new processors and so on. So they knew how to do all of that, they said. This is what actually happened. So they, the, the one year ahead look to 22 nanometers, they missed by a year. Oops. It came out in 2012, not 2011. 14 came out in 2015, not 2013. 10, they didn't make till 2019, four years out. Seven, well, I've put in TBD on the slide. Um, seven is just about coming out with Alder Lake. Alder Lake's the first thing. They did have to redefine what seven meant because Alder Lake was built in the Enhanced Superfin++ plus 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 process, which Enhanced Superfin, you'll have noticed, was the name attached to 10. So they did actually have to redefine what 7 was in order to even get Alder Lake out on 7. So yeah, this, this prediction stuff is tricky. Um, whoops. Um, now, it's also getting ruthlessly expensive. So when I designed that fire path that was built on 130, I could go to 22 different companies to make it. In theory, at least, at the time, Intel wouldn't have offered fab space to me. Um, but 22 companies. Then the number of companies for each leading edge process kept shrinking. And now we're down to three companies left who can make leading edge processes. And we've gone from a fab costing a few hundred millions of dollars to fabs that are just kitting out a fab costs so much. And developing the fab process and the fab investment that needed to maintain going forwards, you know, even for this sort of level of three and a half billion, you're looking at 16, 20 billion dollar fabs. You can run a small country for that. So what do these three leading companies make and what, who are the other people? So leading companies, are Intel, Samsung, TSMC. They're the only people on leading edge. Um, you'll notice that two of them aren't um, Western American type of things, Korean and Taiwanese. So Intel makes seven nanometer, um, which was formerly called 10 nanometer plus, plus, plus. Samsung, they're in volume on four. They've introduced a three nanometer gate all around thing, but it's only suitable for prototyping at the moment. TSMC, the volume's on five and four, and they're in the flows of introducing three nanometer, Apple, among others, are widely expected to have run multiple trials on three nanometer Apple silicon chips. And then Global Foundries, they kept pace all the way along till about 12 when they threw in the towel and sort of almost went backwards. SMIC, Semiconductor Manufacturing in China, no, it's not called that, it's just an easy way to remember who they are. Um, they're, they're sort of stuck on the 10 nanometer generation. United, stuck on the 22 nanometer planar generation and the 14 nanometer FinFET. So it really is one of these three if you want an advanced chip. Translating it into numbers. Um, so num numbers are the great leveler. Everybody's using the same lithography. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, if you look at the names of things and how many transistors per square millimeter, 
we can work out how honest people are being. So back in 2017, TSMC's N10 and Samsung's 10, they're pretty close together at 32, at 52 million transistors per square millimeter. Intel were in 14 plus plus at the time, and that was much worse, 37 million transistors per square millimeter. It's not necessarily the only metric. Um, you can't use this number of transistors per square millimeter to make a processor. Uh, Intel's transistors, they biased them to make them fast. Um, so in 2018, TSMC had gone to seven, Sa Samsung was still on 10, and Intel was still stuck in the same place. 2019, everybody's about 100 million, but with different names. So you can see why Intel had to change their names. 2020, everybody's about 170, 120, 100, Intel behind. Mid-2023, where we are now, uh, TSMC can put about 300 million transistors per square millimeter. That's a big step from back there. Um, Intel about that on Intel 7. So Intel still quite a lot behind. Samsung haven't published enough information for us to compute that number for them, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but they're probably about 250, if I had to guess. So how do we make a, tr a, a, a process? Uh, a transistor, a processor. We use a thing called lithography, so basically printing metal. You can think of it as a photocopier. Um, so we have a master copy that's stuck at the top of the photocopier, and then we can make copies of that. Instead of paper, we're making the photocopier of the layer mask onto a piece of silicon. So we have machines that are very much like a photocopier. And they were about the size of an office photocopier back here. Um, they were using, well, I think back there, they were using optical light. And then they, they started using more exotic forms of light, heading towards machines that were getting quite big, using deep ultraviolet light. So that's a wavelength of about 193 nanometers. You'll have noticed 193 nanometers is a lot bigger than casual talk about 20s and 28s. So the wavelength of light is a fundamental limiter of physics for printing stuff. Um, so we had to be clever and get around that. Um, so we use multiple masks to print each layer where the masks um, are specially arranged in order to print features smaller than the wavelength of light that we're printing with. That was quite expensive to develop too. So uh, up here, we're using um, multiple exposures. Um, so we're usually using quad exposures. So for each layer that we actually want to print, we need four different maths aligned precisely um, to print a, a layer that's at a wavelength smaller. Um, so the pressure up here to get beyond deep ultraviolet to extreme ultraviolet was major. Deep, uh, deep ultraviolet was fairly simple technology, but extreme ultraviolet, 13 nanometer wavelength light, is arcane technology. Um, so here's a, a schematic of an extreme ultraviolet machine. How do you make extreme ultraviolet light? Well, the answer is we go to the cinema and watch Star Wars movies. Um, <clears throat> so under the fab floor, we build a megawatt CO2 laser. We have a droplet generator. It is fed some molten tin and drops little droplets of molten tin into a vacuum. We fire the megawatt laser and vaporize the molten tin in the vacuum. Big flash of actinic light. You've all seen the movies. And some of that light is 13 nanometer in wavelength. So we collimate in the vacuum to catch all the wavelengths that aren't correct and let a beam of 13 nanometer light come out at the end. All of this has to be in a vacuum, the whole thing. And then we uh, can expose with a scanner our um, mask. Our mask has to be a reflection thing because glass is 
uh, opaque to 13 nanometer light. So we moved from transmissive optics to reflective optics along the way. So this machine uh, is now beginning to be used in fabs to print small things. It's 13 nanometer. You'll notice we're claiming that we're doing seven nanometer, um, but we can reduce the number of multiple patterns for things uh, dramatically. Um, now this machine is expensive, 160 million a piece for the, for the first generation ones. The new generations cost more. Um, it's flown around the world in specially constructed jumbo jets. And it's bigger than a photocopier. So here's that machine on the left, and there's a couple of people standing next to it. So that's one fancy photocopier. And the next generation is larger again. So th there are some, some conclusions from all of this. So we can keep going forward. We can have heterogeneous processes in your system, graphics processes, tons of work for processor designers, yay, um, and system on chip designers, yay, and even more work for software people. <laughs> so even so, with performance related to parallel or special purpose processes, pro programs only, users of computers will have to adjust your expectations. I lived through an era where every couple of years you could buy a new computer that was many times faster than the old one. It was worth throwing them away. N now, well, I, I threw away a lot of computers to transition to Apple Silicon, but the old ones from 2006, they're working just fine. They still run operating systems properly and programs. They're only two gigahertz, but the difference between two gigahertz and the sort of three uh, gigahertz that you get average out of a processor um, when it isn't bursting up to five gigahertz and making the room very hot, uh, there isn't much difference nowadays. And they are costing more, these shiny computers. And we can see this if we look at a trend chart of performance. So the transistor line, we can use lots of transistors. Single-threaded performance, this is spec int, um, just levels off between 2010 and 2020. Nothing much happens. Frequencies, they're basically nailed to the spot and have been since about 2006. We can't afford the power. There's the power curve, flat. Logical number of, number of logical cores, well, it, it was one for a very long time and then it went bonkers. You can have as many cores as you like. Um, so what, what happens going forwards? We can use more transistors per processor than we do today. Um, so leading designs were, were in superscalar out-of-order processors with six to eight operations peak per cycle. And that's true across a number of providers. So Intel got to this point first with a Haswell processor. They, there were about six operations per cycle. Then Broadwell Sky Lake, well, loads of lakes, to Coffee Lake and Elder Lake, where we are now. And a processor called Golden Cove is under those. AMD, Zen 2, Zen 3, Zen 4, Apple, Twister, Hurricane, Monsoon, Vortex, Firestorm, and now Avalanche. Um, they're, they're in this ballpark. Superscalar out of order. It isn't particularly energy efficient. We waste a lot of um, energy in the framework of computation, but boy, can we make it run fast. Um, so every, everything's doing that, and Apart from Apple, who, who stay below 4 gigahertz, but Apple, uh, the place where you know, Firestorm and Avalanche, they really are doing eight operations peak per cycle. Uh, it's quite an impressive microarchitecture in there. We can burn transistors um, uh, by having big and little calls. Arm were the first people to invent this. Um, they've renamed their thing. It's now called Dynamic. <laughs> Um, so if, if we've got big superscalar out-of-order cores that are inefficient, we can have little cores um, that have exactly the same microarchitecture and have the operating system swap the work between them to work for power efficiency. Yeah, everything about this is for power, power efficiency. Apple, well, 
lightning, firestorm, avalanche, they're very big cores. And thunder, ice storm, and blizzard, the power efficient cores, they're about middle sized. Um, Arms classic A55 or A520 core is quite small compared with that. And Intel with Golden Cove now have a Gracement core, which is their efficiency core. And that's also middle sized. It's actually comparable to a Haswell is Gracement, but built for a lower performance point. So we get lots of edge transistors. Adding little cores is very cheap, so you get more and more little cores in your systems. And you can have any old architecture you like. Um, you can even have a prime core where you've spent the power budget um, to go really fast, some big cores and some little cores. So that's quite fun. What we compute is also changing. So we've had general purpose computing, then we had signal processors, graphics processors. Now we have deep learning engines, um, variously IPUs, digital neural networks. Um, and these are different, eight or 16 bits or smaller processing. They can use integer rather than floating point, massively parallel. This is a special field. We can write massively parallel software for neural networks, um, particularly things that do convolutional neural networks. A convolution you can express as a matrix multiply, and we can do matrix multiplies very efficiently in hardware. So the Google TPU has 64,000 8-bit integer multiplies per cycle. So we can really use parallelism in this field. We can also make it highly power efficient, where, say, an Intel big core is running at about 5 watts for, let's be generous, about 30 or 40 giga ops. Um, with machine learning, we can do 3 to 5 tera ops per watt. So more power efficient by a long way. We can be even more power efficient with a thing called spiking neural networks, which is the um, hardware realization of the process in your brain. So we have a new performance race. You'll remember the microprocessor curve has gone like that, and it never really did go exponentially up. Here we are in the performance race. This slide defines why we have ChatGPT now. Um, we can have gains from number rep representation getting smaller, much more complex instructions with matrix accelerators and smaller process. But as you've seen for the processors, smaller process doesn't buy you very much. But we can have, you know, look back at 2012, 2013, um, we had about 3.9 tops and were uh, up at the four. 4,000 tops end now on a single chip performance. So we've gone 1,000x up in 10 years of hardware development. Um, there's reason to think this isn't going, this exponential, exponentials never continue forever, but we can push it up a bit more. So what do you get when you buy your shiny thing? This is N1 Max um, being projected by uh, an ordinary M1. So heterogeneous processors. This thing is crammed with processors. 32 cores of GPUs, um, 8x big cores, 2x little cores. Apple will be adding more little cores, I predict, um, into the future. Um, there's a neural network accelerator over here, um, which is 11 tops. You know, a 50 watt desktop chip with all that in it, all running. So we really do have power efficiency for processors. And you know, we're close to the 240-watt desktop chip in performance with this sort of architecture. Apple have invested a lot in memory. There's a computer science law that you can never have too much memory bandwidth, and they've spent a lot of money on it. Intel, bad to beat them over again. Um, there's their historic um, stuff. They're saying, well, well, we'll improve our 7. Intel 7 is going to improve. So uh, whichever is the one after Alder Lake comes out, I think it's 
Is it Rocket Lake Refresh? Whatever. Comes out on 7 plus plus. Um, so, yes, it will get better, honest. Um, now, I mentioned that FinFETs were needed to mend um, planar transistors. Um, well, FinFETs are now running out of steam. We've been doing FinFETs for, for several generations, and now we're going to move into these things. These are called gate all around. So we had a fin uh, with a gate wrapped around it, but now we can wrap the gate all the way around the channel in the middle um, to increase the gate contact area again and also put in multi-gate transistors. So this is three sets of gates around a replicated three-way channel. Um, and they'll probably look more like this because it's hard to make them like that, but they're essentially the same sort of thing. And just to uh, ram home the idea, the nanosheet FETs that are coming, and Samsung are running a bit early on making nanosheet FETs, um, nothing in here is two nanometers. So this is an IBM two nanometer nanosheet transistor. We're looking at a cross section through it. Um, so you can see the little sheet of a channel with the gates wrapped around them. So each nanosheet is 40 nanometers wide for a two nanometer process. Um, it's five nanometers tall, and it goes into the diagram. Into, well, this is actually a scanning electron microscope picture. It goes backwards into the picture by about 12 nanometers for the smallest thing that they can make. Of course, 12 nanometers is only 24 atoms of silicon. So that gives, gets us to 330 million transistors per square millimeter. And it's coming soon, but probably no earlier than 2025, 2026. Uh, skip over that side, I haven't got time. Um, so scientists aren't doing very well, scientists and engineers. Um, wh so where do we spend our research budget if spending it on conventional routes forward isn't working well? We're spending it on packaging and advanced packaging. So this is looking at the patents, patents on semiconductor devices, Patents on packaging going up rapidly. Patents on advanced packaging going up even more rapidly. Um, so it, particularly if you look at TSMC, their patents are going up quite rapidly. Samsung, Intel. So packaging things together, the whole ma making of chips in 2D or 3D. So this is um, M1 Ultra join two M1 maxes together with a silicon interposer and on die, um, well, on carrier memory. This is Zen, central core, and multiple chiplets. So AMD make this in uh, 14 and this in seven originally. They, they've moved them all forwards now. So concentrate where you spend your money on the best transistors. And we can go on top of each other. So here's the AMD X3D with memory chips on top of processor chips. And here's Graph Core's Colossus. So you've got the Colossus die. They can't get the power across it. Colossus is extremely greedy for power. So they've built a chip on top of it upside down to transmit the power better all the way across it. Um, we're, we're looking at ways to cool chips directly. So at present, we cool the outside of the package. Um, if we can inject a working fluid, not water, a working fluid, um, it's usually a mineral oil, then we can push things directly to the die with pressure and take it out. And you, you, can, you can have inlets and outlets mixed so that the tiny little circulations are happening. I don't understand how we can uh, have more than two layers of 3D and cool it like this. Um, and, well, machine learning, we're spending a lot of money on making machine learning better. 
and that makes us the biggest chip ever manufactured. 46,225 square millimeters of silicon, 1.2 trillion transistors, 400,000 optimized cores, just on this wafer, 18 gigabytes of on-chip memory, nine petabytes of memory bandwidth. You can never have too much memory bandwidth. 100 petabit per second fabric bandwidth, and that was built in TSMC 16. You'll have noticed that we were past TSMC 16. It's not leading edge anymore. So can we do better with a modern process? We can. <coughs> so they've built generation two, um, more than twice as many AI cores, um, same area, more than twice as many transistors, more than twice as much onboard SRAM, more than twice as much memory bandwidth and fabric bandwidth. Oh, the power. They managed to keep the power the same. So this thing, 23 kilowatts of energy goes into it to make it compute. So you, you can't turn it on. It, it, um, 23 kilowatts of heat will come out of this 46,000. Um, so that, that shows how the hot plate stuff is real. You have to attach this wafer to a cold plate and put it in a special machine to even turn it on. But boy, do you get some computation out of it. <laughs> so that's what things look like going forward. <laughs> Thank you.